I'm Salvatore Bobonis, and today's lecture is American Tianxia, State and Self at the End of History. The philosopher Georg Hegel famously wrote that the history of the world is nothing but the development of the idea of freedom. And while I might not agree with him for the pre-modern era, I definitely agree that the overarching theme of the modern age has been the development of the idea of freedom. Of course, I'm not the only one. Karl Marx famously began his career as a young Hegelian, and over the course of his career, he took Hegel's master-slave dialectic and developed it, or you might even say refined it, into a bourgeoisie proletariat dialectic for the modern age. Of course, Karl Marx saw the end of history as the victory of the proletariat, uh, the withering away of the state, and the coming of a classless society. Karl Marx was one of the young or left Hegelians. We often tend to forget that there was an entirely separate, and at the time, probably much more influential group uh, known as the right Hegelians. The right Hegelians uh, focused on Hegel's notion of the state as the culmination of history and ultimately came to be associated with the rise of militarism and then Nazism in Germany, which is, I think, why they tend to get written out of history. Uh, nonetheless, we can see a 20th century air of the right Hegelians uh, in the philosopher Alexander Kozhev. Uh, Alexander Kozhev was a Russian-born philosopher who uh, migrated to France and mainly wrote in French. He refined Hegel's concept of the state at, at the end of history into the universal homogeneous state. Uh, Kozhev found all of this latent in Hegel and brought it out and actually put it into Hegel's mouth in his uh, book on reading Hegel. Uh, the universal homogeneous state at the end of history would be what it sounds like, a, a state that is universal, uh, covers everything, is homogeneous, has no class distinctions, but also no racial distinctions, no ethic, uh, ethnic distinctions, no distinctions among citizens of any kind. Uh, and is a, a state that is, is, is not a, a, an end of history where the state has withered away, but is instead an end of history in which the state remains strong. Uh, Kozhev, uh, not coincidentally, was instrumental in uh, providing the philosophical underpinnings for what is now the European Union. And many people, including Francis Fukuyama, have talked about the European Union as being the culmination of Hegel's notion of uh, Hegel's notion via Kozhev of the universal homogeneous state. But farther to the right of the right Hegelians were people who weren't happy uh, living in a universal state at the end of history, uh, preferred uh, the, the continuation of conflict. And, and here the leading light uh, was certainly Friedrich Nietzsche. Uh, Nietzsche famously wrote about the Superman versus the last man. And we all know the Superman. You know, Nietzsche's Superman is the, you know, the man who uh, seeks to create his own destiny through struggle and is maybe the archetype for the, for the Nazi warrior. Uh, but we forget about Nietzsche's last man. Uh, Nietzsche's last man was what he wanted to avoid. It was the, the comfortable man who had no longer any need to struggle at the end of history uh, in Hegel, or as we know it now, via Kozhev's uh, universal homogeneous state. Uh, if Kozhev looked forward to a world in which nobody had to struggle anymore, uh, Nietzsche dreaded a world in which nobody had to struggle anymore. And not just Nietzsche, uh, Leo Strauss was one of uh, Kozhev's main 20th century interlocutors. And most English readers will know Kozhev via Strauss and via the dialogue between Strauss and Kozhev recorded in Strauss's On Tyranny. Strauss himself took Nietzsche's point of view and, and argued that 
you know, Kojev might be right that the world was moving towards a Hegelian universal homogeneous state, but he didn't want any part of it. Uh, you know, Strauss thought that that was terrible, and uh, he really wanted there to be supermen to disrupt this universal homogeneous state. And Strauss actually argued that uh, no matter how comfortable the world became, there would always be those people who, you know, sought to uh, you know, sought to overturn the existing order and to have an impact on history. With that kind of attitude, it's not surprising that Strauss was a an inspiration for a whole generation of uh, American neoconservatives. If you think of pretty much anybody who was associated for the, with the project for a new American century in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, the whole slew of neoconservatives, most famously Paul Wolfowitz, uh, they're all students of or admirers of or readers of Leo Strauss. One of the most famous readers of Leo Strauss was and is Francis Fukuyama. Francis Fukuyama took Kojev's universal homogeneous state and Nietzsche's last man uh, synthesized them via Leo Strauss into his end of history thesis, the end of history and the last man, in which the universal homogeneous state at the end of history was conceptualized as liberal democracy plus, <laughs> forgive me, VCRs and stereos. Now, uh, Fukuyama may not have been much of a technologist, but I think he was a very insightful and is a very insightful uh, political philosopher. He wrote, we might summarize the content of the universal homogeneous state as liberal democracy in the political sphere combined with easy access to VCRs and stereos in the economic. In other words, liberal democracy and consumerism or liberal democracy and the market economy. Fukuyama's original thesis was written in 1989, and for my money, you don't really have to read his 1991 book, The End of History and the Last Man. Read the 1989 essay in The National Interest. It, it's shorter to the point and much more interesting. And all of these ideas about the universal homogeneous state uh, are really right there in the summer, northern summer 1989 article in The National Interest. What's amazing, though, is that Fukuyama wrote that article before Tiananmen Square, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, before the victory of solidarity. All of those events took place be, uh, after Fukuyama wrote his essay, including the breakup of the Soviet Union. So we tend to telescope history, and most retellings of Fukuyama say that you know, inspired by the breakup of the Soviet Union, Fukuyama said it was the end of history. That is an ahistorical reading of Fukuyama's work. Fukuyama said it was the end of history, and then came Tiananmen Square, and then came the fall of the Berlin Wall, and then came the victory of solidarity, and only two years later came the breakup of the Soviet Union. So I think we should see Fukuyama as incredibly prescient to have understood very early that everything was changing uh, in 1989. But I think we can forgive him if he didn't see the full implications of his own thesis. Uh, in fact, over the years, Fukuyama has, he's seemed to tire of being asked over and over again, do you still think it's the end of history? And he seems to have pulled back from the original thesis uh, to say that, well, you know, it's the end of history for some people in some places. Uh, he hasn't really seized the concept and pushed forward with it. Someone who has, uh, leave it to a Russian, is actually the Russian essentialist, uh, often called a nationalist, but really a, a Heideggerian essentialist, uh, autodidact philosopher, uh, Alexander Dugan. Alexander Dugan uh, wrote, when liberalism transforms from being an ideological arrangement to the only content of our extant social and technological existence, then it is no longer an ideology, but an existential fact, 
an objective order of things. What Dugan has understood in his writings is that the victory of liberalism is not just uh, a you know, triumph of the US over the USSR or of you know, one system over another. Uh, it's the final system. Uh, there's only one system standing in the 21st century in the third millennium, and that system is liberalism. Now, of course, Dugan hates that fact, and his work is full of plans to overthrow liberalism, but he himself is very clear that it will be a very difficult thing indeed. The universal homogeneous state at the end of history is not just liberal democracy and the market economy or mar liberal democracy and consumerism. The universal homogeneous state at the end of history truly is universal, that, that is global, covering the entire world, and homogeneous, that is classless, without ethnic distinction, without uh, distinction based on sexuality, w w without distinction based on group membership. Uh, it is a liberal tiansha. Now, tiansha is, of course, the Chinese term for all under heaven. And I think it really encapsulates the end of history that Fukuyama saw. Uh, tiansha depicts an enlightened realm that Confucian thinkers and Mandarins raised to one of universal values that determined who was civilized and who was not. Uh, in today's world, by definition, those who embrace liberalism are civilized. Anti-liberals, by definition, are excluded from civilization. Now, those words about Tian Sha come from the eminent uh, Straits Chinese historian Wang Gungwu. Uh, he coined the term American Tian Sha in a 2013 book on China. Uh, he said, today, an American Tian Sha has a strong global presence. It has a missionary drive that is backed by unmatched military power and political influence. Compared to the Chinese concept, it is not passive and defensive. Rather, unlike other universal ideas, ideals, it is supported by a greater capacity to expand. I think Wang has it absolutely right. And I think if you want to get to the heart of the American Tian Sha, you can look to the founding document of the American Republic, the Declaration of Independence, in which the founders of the United States of America wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is the statement of the coming of the homogeneous society. And the universalization of that society and after 1989 created a Hegelian universal homogeneous state. The American Tian Sha is the universal homogeneous state that Fukuyama was looking for, but did not find. Now, when I say the American Tian Sha, I do not mean the 50 states and territories of the United States of America. The United States of America is merely the central state of the American Tian Sha, or one might say the Zhongguo of the American Tian Sha. Uh, Zhongguo, of course, is China's name for China, uh, but literally it simply means central state, or as it's more colorfully translated, middle kingdom. The United States of America is the central state of the American Tian Sha, but it's not the totality of it. The American Tian Sha is global in scale. When, wherever you go in the world, you are inside the American Tian Sha in the sense that you are inside an ideological zone based on liberalism and the market economy.
Let me contrast with you the classic Ming Tiansha uh, in China and the American Tiansha of today. Now, every Chinese empire had a Tiansha. The Ming Tiansha may be thought of as the ultimate development of this. Uh, and you could look to a, a document like uh, da Ming Lu, the, 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 Ming, the great Ming code, uh, to, for guidance as to what Tiansha meant in the Ming world. Uh, the earlier Song Tiansha and the, the later Qing Tiansha uh, are very similar, uh, but let's keep with the Ming. Uh, at the center, the central uh, core identity of the Ming Tiansha was the Han Chinese. Uh, the Ming code, the great Ming code, distinguished between the Han Chinese inside the Chinese empire and other people who were inside the Chinese empire but were not Han. I think in the same way, we can see the United States of America, actual bona fide citizens of the United States of America, as the very center of the American Xianxia, but more broadly speaking, the central uh, the, the, more broadly speaking, there's an area of shared governance in the Ming Tiansha, which was the entire Ming Empire. Um, in the American Tiansha, uh, the parallel might be the Anglo-Saxon allies. Uh, the United States, United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada um, have complete military interoperability, uh, share intelligence. These are the five eyes country, countries that cooperate to read uh, all uh, essentially all international electronic communications. Uh, you know, the, the five countries are, uh, you know, their, their systems are closely intertwined to the point where it's possible for uh, an Australian media baron, uh, Rupert Murdoch, to move to the UK, become a British media baron, and then to move to the United States and start Fox News, uh, which you know, then became the most popular news channel in America and influential in US elections. So a person who started out uh, influencing Adelaide elections, later influenced Australian elections, later swung British elections, later swung American elections. And the same kinds of patterns uh, have existed for the United States, Canada, uh, and the United Kingdom. There's an enormous shared space. Um, it's not only the media, it's the entire uh, world of governance and ideas. Uh, US think tanks will pick up pieces published by Australian, British, or Canadian think tanks without a second thought. Uh, they're part of the shared discourse of governance uh, in the American Tiansha. Outside that discourse, but sharing the basic uh, philosophies. Well, on the borders, maybe Korea and Israel, but on the Chinese side, outside the shared governance, outside the Ming Empire proper, but still sharing an adherence to Confucian values, uh, were the Confucian tributaries. Uh, so places like the you know, Vietnam and the Ryukyu Islands. Um, some minor dependencies, uh, you know, a small number of little uh, principalities around the South China Sea that accepted uh, Confucian principles and governance from, or suzerainty uh, from Beijing. But on the American Tianxia, we could also compare NATO allies, uh, Japan, South Korea, and Singapore, the, the Pacific allies, uh, perhaps even Sweden, which is not formally an ally of the United States, but Nobody doubts that Sweden shares uh, and the ideology of the American Tiansha, um, you know, liberalism and orientation towards the West. Um, so we can compare this shared ideology based on Confucianism in the Ming space and a shared ideology based on liberalism in the American Tiansha. Now, I would consider this sphere, this third sphere, the sphere of liberalism. And this sphere encompasses pretty much all uh, of the substantial uh, economies of the Western world, uh, plus many uh, smaller outposts uh, around the world as well. Then in the Ming Tiansha, there was the outer layer of countries and places that shared 
Chinese principles in a broad sense. That is, they had treaties with Ming China. Uh, they were willing to play by Ming Chinese terms. They occasionally cooperated with Ming China. And here I include uh, even Russia, uh, which signed a treaty in the, in the 1600s that was relatively favorable to, uh, to Ming China. The era of unequal treaties came 200 years later. Uh, in, in the Ming era in, in the 1500s, in the si early 1600s, uh, in the Qing era of, of the 1600s, early 1700s, uh, Russia was aligned with China in Central Asia uh, against nomadic peoples. Of course, also major Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, uh, Burma, um, and even uh, Yurkins and, and maybe some Mongols uh, on the Ming northern border were broadly aligned with Ming power. They weren't Confucian by any means. They did not accept the Ming emperor as their emperor, um, but they were pro-systemic, uh, certainly not anti-systemic, trying to bring down the Ming system. Uh, Maybe even you might include the Western Europeans. During the Ming era, uh, British and Portuguese traders uh, were willing to kowtow if that meant that they could trade with China. In the American Tianxia, we might think of you know, India, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, pretty much most of the rest of the world uh, as being places that are not liberal, uh, don't share an American ideology you know, in, in its fullest sense, but that are pro-systemic powers that broadly cooperate in American governance of the world. And here we might even include China. China is often thought of as a you know, quote unquote rising power, challenger, enemy of the United States, but there's very little evidence that that's really true. And, and there, there's a ton of evidence that China cooperates with the American global system. Now, I know there's a lot of rhetoric about China challenging America, but I don't think there's a lot of practical evidence uh, that that's really happening. China challenging the Philippines, China challenging Japan, sure. Uh, China challenging the liberal market economy, no. Uh, I don't think there's really ev any evidence of that at all. The BRICS Bank, uh, if anything, has endorsed uh, IMF governance principles, and the BRICS Bank will only fund uh, projects that are aligned with IMF uh, principles. So I, I really can't see China um, as an anti-systemic power. Maybe anti-Philippines or anti-Japan or anti-Vietnam, but not anti the American liberal world order. Okay. That leaves us with just a few external enemies for the Ming, Tianxia, Japan, some Mongol tribes, some Turkic tribes that were outside of the Ming, Tianxia on its borders. But of course, also outside the Ming, Tianxia was an entire world out there. Now, as it happened, uh, the Ming Tianxia collapsed internally due to a peasant rebellion in 1644, and uh, Jurkin invaders, uh, the Manchus, uh, invaded China and replaced the Ming Tianxia with a Qing Tianxia, but they took Da Minglu, the great Ming code, and they simply expanded it into Da Qinglu, the, the great Qing code, and they governed China on Confucian principles, and they continued the tributary relationship with the neighbors of China. So even the Ming-Qing transition uh, you, you can't really be seen as, as an external overthrow of the Tianxia itself. A change in leadership, certainly, a change in who the actual rulers were, but not a change in the system. It took the collision between the Chinese world and the European world in the Opium Wars starting in 1840 uh, to really bring down the Ming Tianxia. Well, the American Tianxia also has its border disputes. Uh, you know, Russia uh, be, try, you know, staying in, in many ways outside the American Tianxia and challenging it in you know, very minor ways from a geopolitical standpoint, uh, challenging the American Tianxia in borderlands like Crimea uh, and Syria, uh, but not making an attempt to overthrow the system. Uh, Russia has made no systematic attempt uh, to put an end 
to the liberal uh, American-centered uh, global governance system. North Korea even less so. North Korea may be a very hostile country, but uh, North Korea is not going to overthrow the Western liberal order. Um, Syria, the same thing. Even Islamic State has no chance of overthrowing the Western liberal order. And there we end. Um, the big difference between the Chinese Tiansha, the Ming Tiansha, Qing Tiansha, and the American one is that the Chinese Tiansha was geographically limited. Uh, the American Tiansha has no external borders. There, there's no over there beyond the seas. There, there, there are no Martian landers that may come and put an end to the American Tiansha. Thus, the American Tiansha is likely to be very stable. It, it can only collapse through internal processes. And even if it were to collapse through an internal process, the successors would likely be built on the same system. Uh, that is, uh, even if the uh, political uh, order in America were to collapse, uh, a President Trump or uh, some other person would, would end up seizing the levers of state machinery in Washington, D.C. and running the American Tiansha, just like uh, the Manchurians seized the levers of state machinery in Ming China and turned it into Qing, uh, Qing China. There is no external power that can overthrow the American Tiansha. Now, I'm not the first person to think of this parallel. I actually have to give credit to uh, Yuan Fun Kong uh, of uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School at National University of Singapore. Uh, Kong wrote an article in, uh, I believe it was 2004, on the American tributary system, uh, interpreting the American world order. He, he didn't use the word American Tian Sha, but the American world order, interpreting it as a tributary system parallel to the Chinese tributary system. And he went through a whole series of dimensions on which they are either you know, parallel or uh, similar. Um, but there are two that he didn't focus on, two that he missed, that I really think uh, we need to consider. One is the ideological dimension with the Chinese Tiansha, the, the Ming or Qing Tiansha being based on Confucianism, the American Tiansha based on individualism. And the second, the one being limited to East Asia, the other one being global. These two differences, I think, uh, are pregnant with implications. Uh, here you see, for example, the, the embodiment of the postmodern uh, Chinese member of the American Tiansha. Uh, this is a, a, a meme, a famous meme, a Chinese student graduating at Harvard Business School, holding in his hands the two symbols he presumably values most, uh, the Chinese flag and the all-powerful American dollar. This is uh, the American Tiansha embodied, and it's made possible uh, by globalism, the Chinese student studying in the United States, but also made possible by liberalism. Uh, it's made possible by the fact that this student uh, is able to become part of a, a larger world that is non-essentialist. It's a postmodern world. Uh, in a modern world of modern nation states, it would be impossible for a student like this to become a member of the American elite. But in the postmodern world, uh, in the liberal world, that is very much a possibility. In fact, that's presumably why you went to Harvard Business School in the first place. Uh, you don't go to Harvard Business School to learn the skills to succeed in business. You go to Harvard Business School to enter the global elite. And there's no barrier to Chinese students doing so. This is one reason why I don't think you can see China as a challenging power to the United States, because Chinese people, and especially elite Chinese people, are much more interested in joining the American Tiansha than in overthrowing it. Look, 80 years ago, 
Uh, 90 years ago, Oswald Spengler wrote, uh, forgive my German, uh, Der Untergang des Abendlandes, uh, the, literally the undergoing of the Western lands, uh, the, uh, the decline of the West. Right? So this book was written at the end of World War I, actually published at the end of World War I, written during World War I, and it, it inspired, uh, you know, although Spengler was not himself a Nazi, uh, it inspired uh, Nazi dreams that the, the, you know, the West was over and a new energetic East would overthrow the Western order. And of course, there were plans for a Nazi invasion of England. And it's something that I just find, uh, you know, I, I don't mean to, to laugh at the Nazis, um, but sometimes maybe laughter is the best medicine. Uh, the Nazi plans for the invasion of England pointed out that Eton College uh, was the school to send children of the senior Nazi uh, occupation official officers and officials. Uh, that is, the Nazi plans, uh, Operation Sea Lion, to invade England may have been in, in some ways a, a backdoor attempt uh, to get the children of Nazi leaders into exclusive uh, English uh, uh, public schools uh, to get them into Eton and, and the other famous schools of England. I, I just find that incredible, but, but not so incredible if you consider that UK independent schools today publish statistics on their foreign student enrollments. The number one source <laughs> is China. Uh, so in 1940, uh, the Nazis wanted to get their children into Eton uh, in 2015, uh, the people who most wanted to get their children into Eaton uh, were Chinese millionaires. And right behind the Chinese millionaires, Hong Kong-based millionaires, uh, who, of course, uh, are many of them also Chinese millionaires. Uh, number three, uh, if anyone wants to guess, um, Russia. <laughs> so the top three contributors, foreign contributors of students to... English independent schools, these exclusive schools in England that uh, you know, train elite students who go on to Oxford and Cambridge and Harvard and such. Um, the, the top three sources of foreign students are putatively uh, the places, or at least two of them, Hong Kong and Russia, uh, China and, and Russia, putatively the places that are going to overthrow the American liberal order. Well, you know, uh, again, I, I find it um, not credible to surmise that uh, Chinese and Russian elites uh, are trying to overthrow the Western order by getting their children educated at uh, Eton and Harrow colleges. Okay. And of course, you don't have to go uh, to an English public school uh, to get into a top university. Uh, you can go directly from China or Russia. And where are the top universities? Well, according to the Chinese own ranking system, the Shanghai Jiao Tong University, World University rankings, the Shanghai rankings, uh, if you look at a list of the top 20, well, there you go. America, 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 Britain, America, 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 Britain, America, 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 Britain, America, number 20. Uh, a Swiss university sneaks in at number 20. 19 of the top 20 universities in the world by Chinese reckoning are American and British universities. And not just the first 20, uh, the next 20 as well. So if you go you know, 21 through 40, uh, you get a couple of Japanese universities in uh, Canadian, which is also a part of, clearly part of the American Tianxia, a Danish school, a French school. But uh, the dominance of Anglo-American universities in the, in the Chinese university rankings is, of course, overwhelming. And the number of students who go to them is similarly overwhelming. Uh, of 4.2 million Chinese students who have gone abroad to pursue education in the last uh, 35 years, only 2.2 million have returned to China. Now, that doesn't account for the fact that many of those who returned maybe didn't want to return, but couldn't get a visa to stay as a permanent resident uh, in the West. It also doesn't account for the fact uh, that uh, some of those returnees 
uh, keep a foot in both worlds and, and are not permanent returnees. Roughly speaking, something like half of the Chinese students who go abroad to study, and there are a lot of them, uh, roughly half of them stay abroad uh, permanently. Um, they don't want, these Chinese elites don't want to build their lives in China to develop China so it can overthrow the West. This is not uh, the, the Germany of World War I challenging the West. Uh, it's impossible to imagine in Germany in 1910 the German elites falling over themselves to get their kids into British and American universities. We live in a very different world. Uh, we live in a world in which the returns to individuals of joining the American Tianxia are so great uh, that that undermines the, I would say the the uh, undermines the integrity, the coherence of countries themselves. Um, one need look no further than the Harun Report. The Harun Report is the the Bible of of the Chinese uh, rich, the, you know, the Chinese rich list, China's Fortune magazine. The Harun Report does a regular survey of the citizenship uh, plans of China's wealthiest people. Uh, the Harun Report reports that 64% of Chinese multimillionaires either have foreign citizenship or are planning to get foreign citizenship or, or foreign, for a foreign permanent residence. Uh, the top destinations, no surprise, number one, United States, number two, Canada, and Canada famously is a back door into the United States. So many of those uh, going to Canada are actually going to the United States but couldn't get in. Uh, number three, uh, England. Number four, Australia. Uh, number five uh, is, I think, um, the European Union as a whole. They don't have statistics on breaking it out. Uh, so where are the Chinese going? The highest educated, the wealthiest Chinese are going to the American Tianxia, to the very liberal core of the American Tianxia, primarily the United States. And if they can't get into the US, Canada, UK, Australia, maybe New Zealand. They're also the babies. Uh, China and the United States now have a reciprocal agreement for 10 year tourist visas. Uh, so multiple entry tourist visa for 10 years. It used to be the case that when Chinese women tried to get into the United States, if they appeared pregnant at their visa interviews, uh, U.S. Uh, consular officials would deny them a visa. At least that's the rumor that has, not just a rumor, it's, it's a widely, uh, you know, widely understood uh, uh, widely, uh, well, widely understood understanding uh, throughout throughout China. Um, but now you can get a 10-year visa, which means that a Chinese woman can get a visa, you know, at age 20 or 22, just after finishing at university. Uh, and then when she gets pregnant five years later, seven years later, can just board a flight to the U.S. No need to go apply for a visa, 10-year multiple entry visa. Uh, the number of USA babies being born is unknown, but staggering. And I know it's staggeringly large because every time I fly back and forth to China, uh, I find myself uh, in, the, in the immigration line uh, with women who have Chinese passports, uh, whose babies have American passports. And if I'm seeing this every time I travel, uh, I know it's not a small phenomenon. Now look, there are entire hospitals uh, in Southern California that exist solely to service the needs of uh, Chinese women who are coming to the U.S. to have their babies. Uh, there are even movies about Chinese women, uh, romantic comedies about Chinese women who come to America to have their babies. It's such a well-known phenomenon in China that you can make a popular movie script around it and everyone knows what you're talking about. Um, when people are eager to have USA babies, they're not eager to declare war on the United States. We have entered a new postmodern world, uh, a world in which individuals seek to develop 
their own identities and their own place in the world without much regard to the nation states to which they are nominally aligned by citizenship and passports. Now, that postmodern world may seem very new, uh, but in fact, it has deep roots. Uh, Arnold Toynbee, the famous world historian, dated the beginning of the postmodern world very precisely uh, in 1875. And I think he correctly said that it began in the United States. Now, he didn't give a reason for 1875. My own instinct is that he chose that date because it was 100 years after the Declaration of Independence. Um, the Declaration of Independence was, I think, the first recognizably postmodern document. And it took perhaps 100 years, or in Toynbee's case, 99 years, for this uh, postmodern document of the Enlightenment to ultimately become something like reality. Now, what I mean by that is that the, the feeling, the, the actual popular sentiment that all men, and, and let's face it, by 1875, we were only talking men, not women, uh, but the sentiment that all men are created equal, that there's nothing special about big men, you know, about presidents and generals and uh, you know, artists, but that all men are created equal. That notion really came to really came to be embedded in the American psyche after the Civil War. And let me give you an example. Here's the State of New York Monument at Gettysburg National Cemetery in the United States, built 1893. The State of New York Monument is not a monument to a general. It's not you know, Nelson's column. Uh, it is a column to the ordinary soldier. It's topped by an allegorical figure of New York State shedding tears for the deaths of the men uh, who have died in the Battle of Gettysburg. And around the bottom are uh, bronze plaques listing the names of the men of New York who died in the Battle at Gettysburg. Now, as far as I can tell, lists of names of the fallen uh, originated in American Civil War remembrance only came to happen in, in uh, the UK and in UK Commonwealth countries after World War I and only spread to the rest of the world and then only certain parts of the rest of the world after World War II. Similarly, Memorial Days, the first Memorial Day uh, was in the 1870s in the United States. Uh, it was called Decoration Day the day that you brought flowers to decorate the graves of the fallen. That's why American Memorial Day is in May, traditionally May 31st, because that's when flowers were available. Uh, whereas uh, British Commonwealth uh, Remembrance Days are November 11th, commemorating World War I. Uh, so what, what the Civil War was for the United States, World War I was for the rest of the English-speaking world, and the non-English-speaking world only it only entered post-modernity uh, much later. If I, if I were to give some, some vague dates, I, I would suggest post-modernity arrived in America after the Civil War, arrived in the British Commonwealth uh, after World War I, maybe arrived in France roughly around that same time, I'm not sure, uh, only spread to Germany uh, after World War II, and you could, might even say only spread to the Eastern uh, Bloc uh, after 1991. In any case, the Civil War was the, the traumatic moment in American history. Uh, something around 20% uh, of all Union soldiers were killed. Uh, around 40%, 40% of all Confederate soldiers died in the Civil War. Uh, the average death toll for the, for the United States as a whole was 30% of soldiers died in the Civil War. Now, you can find all sorts of war memorials around Australia and the UK. But even in Australia, which was you know, famously hard hit by World War I, 15% um, of soldiers died in the war. So the American casualties in the Civil War were twice as high 
uh, as the Australian casualties were uh, a generation later or two generations later in World War I. So you can imagine why uh, people thought the, that the, the loss of life had to be commemorated, but it wasn't generals. It was the loss of life of ordinary soldiers. And this becomes particularly poignant in other monuments. For instance, this is the uh, 138th New York Infantry Regiment. Uh, here you can see uh, a very postmodern monument, and this is a postmodern monument from 1888. Uh, the monument doesn't have cannons on it or battleships or you know rifles. Well, the, the 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 monument is a tree stump, and on the tree stump is the soldier's kit, uh, the drum, uh, a dispatch bag. There is a rifle leaning up against the tree stump. Uh, that is, this is a monument, a sad monument to commemorate the loss of ordinary soldiers. And the, the material of the monument is the ordinary soldier's kit in 1888. Uh, here's another one uh, with, uh, uh, again, a, a New York monument uh, with the, uh, uh, God, uh, with the uh, muse Cleo uh, writing the deeds of the 123rd New York Regiment uh, into the, the scrolls of history. Uh, here's a particularly poignant one. Uh, the 54th Regiment of, of New York uh, soldiers, uh, there was a flag boy, you know, a, 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 there, you know, a, a boy who carried the colors, uh, you know, non-combatant carrying the flag in battle, who shot, was shot and died in battle. That boy was commemorated on the monument. So the, the main figure on the monument is not a, a god, is not a general, is, is not... The main figure on the monument is a boy who was killed carrying the flag, a you know, particularly poignant one. And I could go on and on. There are 90 New York State monuments at Gettysburg Battlefield. And that's just the New York State monuments. There are a couple hundred monuments to soldiers from other states of the Gettysburg Battlefield. And that's only Gettysburg. There, there are a hundred other battlefields of the American Civil War. Um, there are thousands of American Civil War monuments, and overwhelmingly, they are monuments of ordinary soldiers, at least the northern ones are. Interestingly, the South, which was maybe less advanced down the road to postmodernity, uh, much more commonly put great heroes on its monuments. Uh, General Lee, most of all, uh, Jefferson Davis, the president of the Confederacy, General Beauregard, uh, Stonewall Jackson. Uh, the South commemorated the, the glorious generals. The North commemorated the fallen soldiers. Or perhaps my favorite monument is the monument to the Civil War correspondents, the, the first reporters uh, of the postmodern age. Uh, war correspondents have their own memorial uh, just outside Antietam Battlefield uh, in Western Maryland. I think that Toynbee was right to date the postmodern self from the period after the American Civil War and to understand that it, it spread from there and, and that the, you know, the Jackson Pollock painting underneath this slide is of a kind with the monuments to uh, the fallen soldiers of the Civil War because both embrace the dignity of the individual. And a hundred years uh, later, a hundred years after the beginning of postmodernity, of course, we have the ultimate postmodern. The, you know, the, uh, no more war. This is just the individual celebrating individuality uh, by the 1970s. And look, postmodernity can be defined as the democratization of individuality. Uh, you don't have to be Leonardo or Newton or Napoleon or Hitler to be an individual. Every person is an individual. Every person's story matters. Everybody has an identity. And postmodernity then becomes the leitmotif of the American Tian Sha. Running through the rise of America is the story of postmodernity. Uh, the great immigrant waves into America in the late 19th century were waves of people who gave up their essentialist, you know, Heideggerian uh, design, you, you know, their, their sense of being um, 
and just melted into the postmodern American identity. Uh, you know, my own family are uh, Italians and Greeks uh, from you know, 100, 150 years ago who came to America and simply became Americans. They developed their own identities. Uh, instead of having identities that were you know, given to them at birth, they created their own new identities. And there's nothing more postmodern than that. But as America has expanded and, and as, the, as the reach of America has expanded, we have moved from an era when people moved to America to become postmodern individuals, the late 19th century, to an era when America comes to you. Uh, you can attend a, a, an American style university and get an American degree uh, in Singapore, in, in Germany, in, in China, in, in all across Africa, in, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, in fact, it's very difficult to find universities today that don't want to Americanize. Uh, even in Russia, uh, the highest prestige universities all have programs, formal programs. Now, they call it to professionalize uh, their research and their curricula, but the model that they're professionalizing on is an American model of higher education. Um, the American Association of Colleges and Schools of Business um, have accredited business schools everywhere in the world. Uh, it's the gold standard for business education to be accredited by the American accrediting body. Well, what does that mean? Uh, it means that no matter where students study business, they study American principles of business. When we seek out success as individuals, no matter where we are and no matter what our passports may say we are, we ultimately are seeking a place in the liberal American Tiansha. In this postmodern American Tiansha, every individual participates directly in a single global sovereignty. They may have more or less rights in that sovereignty. Uh, you know, someone whose last name is Bush or Clinton has more rights than an ordinary American voter. And an or ordinary American voter has more rights than a Canadian. But something that you don't realize is that even a Canadian has more influence on the American elections uh, than a German. Because Canadians are part of the discourse that shapes opinion in those United States elections. A German is less so. But even a German is more so uh, than a Russian. And even a Russian is more so than a Tajik. There are circles of membership in this postmodern uh, American Tian Sha, uh, but there's only one Tian Sha to be a member of. There's a flip side to that, which is that national politics uh, is increasingly irrelevant. Uh, Fukuyama thought the American Tian Sha, or I'm sorry, Fukuyama thought the end of history was uh, liberal democracy. Well, keep the liberal nix the democracy. Uh, democracy may be the form of government, but when decisions are made, or not necessarily made, when ideas are shaped, when the ideas that determine decisions are shaped at a global level, being informed by an American view of how the world should be run, well, your country may be a democracy, but it doesn't mean that your country is actually voting on issues uh, that will determine your country's destiny. Now, the, the, the classic example of that for uh, 2016 is the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, the Trans-Pacific Partnership fundamentally undermines uh, national democracy in all sorts of ways. Um, well, not all sorts of ways, in ways that are shaped by American liberal thought and the American Tiansha. The result is post-political movements on people who are not seeking power, but who are protesting power. Uh, movements like the Hacker Collective Anonymous, uh, movements like uh, Nuit Debout 
in uh, in Paris and across uh, French-speaking Europe, uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, you know, Indignados, you know, all over the world, or at least all over Europe uh, and North America, um, there have been protest movements against, uh, well, against the political system. And let's face it, the political system is democratic. So what do people want? Uh, they want something that is maybe incoherent because no matter what political system they have, democracy, dictatorship, uh, something in the middle, that political system will make decisions based on principles that come from outside the country, that come from this overarching American Tiansha. Of course, the ultimate postmodern political leader is the reality TV star, uh, Donald Trump. Um, Donald Trump is emblematic of post-modernity, uh, of the uh, you know, postmodern self, the, the construction of the, the individual and the individual mattering more than democratic rules, more than uh, political systems, more than modern technocratic uh, procedures. Um, the, the, the victory of Donald Trump, and we don't know whether he'll win the election or not, at least as of the recording of this lecture, uh, but we do know that he's come very close. And he's come very close as a postmodern individual in a broader liberal American global system, uh, not as somebody who worked his way up the ladder of American politics uh, as it's construed at the national level. Look, Gorg Hegel uh, said that the history of the world is nothing but the development of the idea of freedom. And he was smart enough, impression enough to realize that America is therefore the land of the future, where in ages that uh, lie before us, or at least that lie before him, uh, the burden of the world's history shall reveal itself. Freedom is a wonderful word, and, and it's a wonderful thing. I, I wouldn't want to live in a world that is not free. But freedom, or specifically the sense of freedom as liberty, uh, the liberty of the individual to do whatever the individual wants and, and, and make of herself or himself you know, whatever she or he wants to be, uh, you know, the liberties of, you know, uh, the, the, the freedoms of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for the individual um, at a systemic level, at, at a global level, act to create a, a, a larger polity, a, a larger way of, of thinking um, that transcends national boundaries, um, but not in a generic way in a specifically American way. Um, there's only one country, well, only one major country in the world um, whose people are organically postmodern, uh, where nobody except a very small number of, of indigenous people can claim a connection to the soil. Uh, that one country is the United States of America. Uh, as we move into a postmodern world, that postmodern world is inevitably an American world merely by virtue of the fact that it is postmodern. Thank you for listening. Uh, you can find out more about me at my website at salvatorbabonis.com where you can also sign up for my monthly newsletter uh, on global affairs.